Hi, it's Mike with Utastic. Today I'm sitting down with Matt Ruby, the founder of Vuza. Uh, you can go look at their videos at vuza.com, V-O-O-Z-A.com, and at Vuza HQ on Twitter. Uh, they're the startup comic strip. You might have seen them or exchanged their, their videos uh, through viral uh, social media. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, sit down and, and chat, Matt. Sure, thanks for having me. So, Vuza H, uh, excuse me, Vuza, Vuza dot com. That's uh, you know, that's a very startup y uh, uh, a name. Where did you come up with the the name, and and where did Vuza, the show, come from? Uh, the name I actually registered the URL probably like eight years ago, and I, I don't know why. I just <laughs> made up the word, and it was available, and figured I'd, I'd snare it for some unforeseen future purpose, and. Uh, it's funny, I heard nothing about it whatsoever for years, and then the week before we launched, I got an offer on the domain name. For, oh, really? Uh, and you're like, oh, this is valuable. <laughs> yeah, and it was like, oh, God, but well, we already had done all, all the branding and logo stuff and other things, and I just wanted to launch. So it was, it was just funny, eight years of nothing, and then the week before, I'm going to use it. Yeah. So I, someone comes along and is like, hey, I'll give you money for that. But, so you, you obviously, you have some background in technology, but... Uh, is is that I mean how did Vuza come to be was it just out of humor that you were seeing in tech or yeah I mean I think uh, it was kind of a few different things coming together I had I'd worked in tech for a long time I worked at a company called 37 Signals uh, I was actually the first employee there and uh, worked with Jason and David on the books and uh, some of the marketing stuff I originally had started off there as a web designer um, and so I'd been there for, I think I, I worked there for 10 or 11 years, and I, I had also started doing stand-up comedy about halfway through that, and I'd been working, I live in New York, so working as a comedian here and doing a bunch of shows and meeting a lot of talented people that way. Um, eventually, I parted ways with 37 Signals, and I was looking to do more comedy stuff, and I felt like, okay, well, it's interesting that I know all the stuff about the tech world. Mm -hmm. It felt like there was a lot of opportunities in the video space. Um, which I still think there are. It just seems sort of like the the network model was crumbling, and and TV as we know it is kind of falling apart, and something new is going to rise up in its place. I don't think anyone really knows what yet, but it just seemed like there was an opportunity there from a business standpoint, and then also just for me on a personal sort of uh, unification theory mission of how could I bring together like the comedy stuff that I want to be doing more of, and uh, my tech background and. So it sort of came up with the idea of, of Vuza as a way to kind of combine those two things and, you know, sort of make fun of the tech world at the same time because <laughs> I, I, I had been immersed in it for a while and seen, you know, anytime you have people who are uh, really pretentious and lack self-awareness, there's, a, there's, there's, room for, there's room for comedy. And I think the, the tech world seems to have an endless supply of that. So, so two really interesting backgrounds. I mean, that you were doing stand up and also Thirty Seven Signals, which which I'm familiar with them. Sure. <laughs> uh, they're for those who might not know, they're the the base camp company now, and uh, founder of Rails and all kinds of neat books that are really great. Um, but uh, you know, you you mentioned the stand up. I mean, going from from a, a nice web designer position uh -huh. with a very reputable, solid company to, to stand up. That is, I mean, there, there's startup dreams and then there's like big risks that, that was quite the launch. I mean, did you have a, I mean, you said you've done stand up, but did you have a background in actually doing performance art like this and in any kind of syndication before? No, I'd, I'd actually been in a band for years. I was in a rock and roll band when I lived in Chicago, um, and I'd done that for a long time. And then when I moved to New York, that's sort of when I, I got involved in comedy and started diving into that more. Um, I guess through 37 Signals, we did do some sort of comedic things making fun of the tech world. We had a, a fake site called Enormacom, uh, and we also did like some fake press releases and things that were sort of maybe, you know, embryonic versions of Vuza of making, making fun of the tech world and, and how seriously people take themselves and how they're focusing a lot of times seemingly on the wrong things. Um, but yeah, no, I've, I've always been making stuff, either writing or making music or doing stand-up or, you know, eventually stand-up led into sort of doing more video work and sort of creating, uh, you know, sketches and things like that. So I think, uh, you know, it was, it was just sort of a natural fit and I just sort of, just personally speaking, just try to keep chasing whatever's, you know, exciting to me at the time or turning me on. And, you know, as I got more and more into comedy, I kind of wanted to... Uh, I, I love doing it, but I also wanted to try to figure out, is, hey, is there a way to make something that I like and that I'm proud of and that also makes money and is sustainable and, and you know, isn't involving, you know, just being on the road constantly or something like that. 
Right. So I, th that kind of leads me to the question of, of the team and, and the, uh, the ensemble that you've put together. Are these uh, other developers that you've worked with and kind of had a, a comedic bent with? Or how did, how did the VUZA team come to be? Sure. They're all comedians here in New York. All the, the cast members on the show are stand-up comedians and performers here in New York. And um, it's interesting because it's, it's finding people who also seem believable in a startup environment, but also are funny and, and good at stand-up. And so you have to, you have to kind of find that, that good uh, middle ground, I guess. And uh, we work with a production crew and a director and here in New York who also have a lot of experience doing comedy videos and comedy stuff. So I think for me, it's like the more everyone involved in it can come from a comedy background. I think that's the hardest thing to do is to make it funny. I think, you know, I can kind of plant the seeds of like, hey, here's the reality of the tech world or what's, mm -hmm. what's the real thing that's happening and kind of explain it to people and then they can kind of go from there and, and figure out what's the way to make it funny. So that, that kind of makes me wonder then when you do those, what is LinkedIn kind of a bit? Are, yeah. are these people just kind of ad-libbing that they don't really yeah. know what LinkedIn is? Yeah, those are episodes <laughs> where I, I don't even tell them what they're gonna what they're gonna be talking about. We just turn the camera on and we ask them to explain, you know, skeuomorphic design or something like that, yeah. and just sort of hear what answers come out. So that's that's the fun thing about working with you know stand-ups and you know they're good improvisers and able to to think on their feet. So uh, most of the episodes we do have scripts for. You know, uh, but I'd say it's it's similar to maybe how Larry David fil films Curb Your Enthusiasm in that we we know where the scene's going to start and where it's going to end, and there might be a couple like you know words or bullet points we want to hit, but we also want to give people room to improvise or just sort of make something up on the spot because a lot of right. times that's that's the freshest or, or funniest part of the episode. I, I I have to say that I think it was the one with LinkedIn where at the very end uh, the, the the lady who does the uh, marketing director. Yeah. Uh, role, uh, you know. Actually, actually, I want to real quick. Do the, do your characters all have names or? They do. Yeah, her name is Laura. Or Laura. So yeah. when Laura gets asked, she says, "Oh, I I have to take this," and she just walks away. It was that was so perfect for a marketing type. Just, <laughs> just doesn't want to acknowledge that they don't know something. I've seen that in action. So it was like just perfect. Uh, Mar marketing is a job that never ends you're, you're always putting a spin on everything right yeah yeah so uh so you're you're saying that a lot of the people that you're working with are not techies or actors who are i mean how do they sometimes react to like off camera like really do is this what startups are like sure i, I think at first when we started because we've been around you know over two years now um coming up on 100 episodes actually uh, and at first, I think there was more of that of explaining, you know, like, okay, here's here's why this happens in the tech world and what it means, and you know, words like pivot or disrupt are being thrown around. Um, but I think what's actually it's been interesting to me to watch is like something that I think I used to think was a very niche sort of techie only sort of way of speaking or or, or knowledge base has mm -hmm. really been expanded to to the world at large. I think you see movies like The Social Network and shows on HBO like Silicon Valley and the fact that. Everyone's got a smartphone. Everyone's got apps. Everyone, you know, knows about Snapchat and Facebook and reads these articles about the valuations. And I think the a lot of the stuff that we're touching on the show is sort of breaking it out into a mainstream sort of uh, audience of people who just all kind of you know, tech is just sort of a way of life. It's not really this niche thing like it was five or ten years ago. I don't think. Right. Yeah. It's 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 so embedded in the culture. I mean, it's gone out of business magazines and now it's almost, I mean, what does that show the, the, um, uh, Silicon Valley. You right. Know? I mean, and that's a mainstream show that people are watching outside of, of, uh, of, of tech culture. Uh, sure. Even my sister-in-law who is a, is a medical student, she watched it. So, yeah. uh, th th that says a lot about, you know, how it's that culture is, is getting out of, of actual Silicon Valley. Um, and, and as far as as uh, where you draw your ideas from, I mean, do you do you have like a backlog of ideas that you work from? Uh, you know, do you guys do like a what is it a spitball session? I don't know what it's called for you guys <laughs> in the entertainment biz. Um, you know, where you just come up and say like, hey, let's sketch out an idea, or, or like, how do you come up with the scripts or at least the gist for an episode? Sure, there is. I just sort of have a huge notes file or, or database. I actually use an, an app called Scrivener that I keep everything in. And so there's kind of like a list of 
a hundred different topics that I think might be funny for episodes, whether it's it's uh, uh, an article that I read, you know, in, in uh, the Next Web or TechCrunch or some publication like that, or if it's an interview that I, I see with with David Karp where he has a funny quote or something that I think is funny, um, or anywhere else. There, there's just sort of, uh, you know, uh, I read an article recently about the toothbrush test, which apparently is uh, something that Google uses when they decide whether to acquire a company or not, and I just, the idea... <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah, and the idea of Larry Page talking about the toothbrush tests. <laughs> as soon as I see that, I'm like, okay, well, that's that's going to be a Vooza episode. We get we have yeah. to do something on this, and so then I, I have to learn what that actually means, and then be like, okay, well, how can we make this funny? And then it's it's me sort of probably generating most of the ideas of the seed, and then I kind of I, I work with other cast members and writers to actually write the scripts, and so sometimes it'll be me be explaining like, hey, here's this silly thing that happens. How can we incorporate that into the show? And um, just throwing out ideas and again like the cast also definitely has a lot of input into what they think is funny or even when we're actually shooting being like hey why don't we try it this way or, or just improvising stuff on the spot so I think uh, a lot of times it's just you know sort of creating that framework um, of hey here's the subject and the topic now but feel free to like kind of play around with it and see where it goes. Yeah and it, it just reminds me of what I, I was listening to uh, you know I listened to Sirius uh, XM they have you know that uh, comedy channel. I can't, so I can't remember the name of the comedian who said this, but he he described it where people ask him how he's how he gets to be funny, and he says, "Well, I watch the news. <laughs> you know, he, if you watch the news, you just got to take it out of context, and it's hilarious because it's even in context, it's often hilarious." It's yeah, hilarious. I mean, I think it's a good point. I mean, so much of of the stuff I see at tech blogs or the interviews that I hear or read, I'm like. Uh, this is almost comedy already, you know, I, like a lot of times it's just taking like an actual quote from, you know, some some startup CEO and just making it maybe like 10% more absurd. But like the basis of what's ridiculous about it a lot, like people in the tech world are saying ridiculous things all the time that are almost hilarious. They're just yeah. like saying it with a straight face, you know, whereas we, we put a little wink on it where I think, you know, people get the joke a little more. Well, yeah, you only have to take it a little a little bit beyond what they're already saying to make it pretty absurd. Yeah. I mean, just the toothbrush test. I, I hadn't heard of that, but, I mean, already it's it's on its face, it's absurd. And you sure. just go a little bit further and maybe make it – I'm not a comedian, so I'll just leave it to you. But <laughs> you just got to go a little bit further, and it's it's hilarious. But – um. Uh, I, I'd also like to just ask a little bit about, you know, kind of like your your um, uh, process for shooting and and for for what 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 is the day like on a Vuza set? Do you do you do do you do shooting every day? Is there a schedule? Uh, how many camera people do you have? You know, what is that like? Sure, uh, I'd say we shoot about one weekend every six weeks or so, and we'll try to film, you know, between eight and. 12 episodes during that weekend. So it's a pretty hectic schedule. We, you know, we, we shoot uh, two days. This is usually how we work anyway. We shoot two days straight. Uh, there's an office that we film at uh, in New York, near Union Square. Uh, our crew is, it's a pretty skeleton crew. We have a director, who, uh, his name is Jesse Scaturo, who does a great job. Mm -hmm. um, and he brings his crew in. It's usually him, uh, a DP, uh, and a sound guy. Sometimes there's maybe you know, one other person there too. Um, and then we have our cast, which is usually, you know, between five or ten people are there. Um, and it's really, it's, it's filming like sort of run and gun style where we're just trying to, you know, kind of do things quickly but give people some room, room to play with stuff. Uh, we're usually filming the scenes, you know, five, five, five times, ten times maybe with the two camera setup. And then we'll switch the cameras and kind of get reverse angles and, and close-ups and things like that and shoot it a few more times that way. And then from there... Uh, the editor has something to work with to put it all together. Um, so that, that's sort of a, a general overview of how we work. Okay, so it, it's not, I mean, it is it is pretty loose. It isn't like big scripted formulaic, two camera, Lucy enters stage left. Right. It's, it's, it's pretty... I mean, we, I view the script as sort of like something to fall back on. The script mm -hmm. is a framework where it's like, hey, if we're rushed or if we, if we don't have time or no one else has any other ideas, then yeah, let's get that and, 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 and bang it out and move on. Uh, but I think also part of, part of what I think is, is fun about the show is that we, don't, we have low overhead. We, we have a small crew. Uh, and whereas, uh, but that to me is an advantage in a lot of ways. Like if you look at a lot of these other sitcoms on, on you know, major networks, 
they've got crews of, you know, like dozens of people and this huge lighting setup and every second that they're filming is costing them thousands of dollars. Right. Um, and that puts a ton of pressure and makes you want to move really fast and makes you just bang stuff out and gives you no room to like deviate from the script at all. And I think you can kind of sense that in a lot of those shows. They just have that sort of formulaic feel, whereas I, I kind of like working cheap and with a, a, a loose crew and a loose script. And you, I, I feel like the more you get that playful environment and, and vibe going on the set and, and with the cast and crew, that kind of comes out in the final product that you can feel that it's, it's people having fun and, and there's something loose about the whole thing. Right. And, and, and also, I mean, now that you kind of mentioned it, the, the formulaic, like you look at the big bang theory, which is, you know, a very popular and a lot of people look at that as, as a view into engineering, startup techie programming right. culture. But as a developer myself, I watch it and it is just cringe. Yeah. It just it's painful for me to watch it because I could see the setup and I could see how they uh, tried to telegraph a joke or something like that. Whereas it seems like more with Visa, you just kind of let it ride. And yeah, I think you know uh, that show is not meant for actual engineers or or tech people. You know, I think that's that show is uh, meant for people. You know, it's the same way. Like, but I, I know a few engineers who adore that show. Really, it's hilarious, and I, I'm like, ah. yeah, I'm, a, I'm on your side. To me, it's, it's also just even that, that, that format of the, the laugh track, and mm-hmm. even when they say a joke that's not funny, everyone erupts in this raucous laughter. I'm like, are you watching the same show as yeah. me? Because that was not that funny, and then it, just the whole thing kind of feels phony. And yeah, I'm, I'm much more uh, shows like uh, Peep shows, this UK show, or Curb Your Enthusiasm, or things without a laugh track, things mm-hmm. Spinal Tap, and you know. Uh, all those movies, you know, things that, that kind of uh, let the audience sort of breathe a little bit more and decide for themselves where they think something is funny as opposed to, you know, a, a lot of uh, sitcoms or mainstream stuff seems a little bit like it's spoon-fed to you. And, and I'd rather, like, kind of let people figure out for themselves where the punchline is. Yeah, and even then, it's, I mean, I've watched a couple of Vooza episodes where I recall it wasn't, like, laugh out loud. It was more of a, a empathy, empathy, sympathetic, sure. like... Yeah, they got it. <laughs> like that yeah. Was, that was, yeah, that's. I'm not gonna laugh because, yeah, that's about. It. I mean, it's kind of like Dilbert, where you you don't. Maybe it's not laugh because you can kind of want to cry a little bit. Yeah, no, it's a, it's an interesting point because I think that also speaks to you know what's your goal when you're creating online video. Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's a little bit different. Like we still want to be funny and have it be good, but I think there is like when you talk about that empathy factor, I think that's also really an important part of why people share stuff and, you know, like why people, like I remember being at 37 signals and engineers were always sharing Dilbert cartoons with each other in our, you know, campfire group chat room and being like, huh, that's interesting that this isn't always the funniest stuff, but people yeah. are being like, Hey, you're going to get this. It's, I think there's that. I want to share this because they, they get this thing and I get it and I want to share it with you because you'll get it and why people share stuff online, I think is an interesting sort of, psychological factor but yeah there's definitely episodes where we're sometimes being like okay you know this one's hilarious and and we'll hit a broad audience and then there's other ones where we're like all right this one might not be as laugh out loud funny but i think you know hey like engineers or marketing people are gonna be like oh yeah i know that person or i've i've heard that phrase and 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 god i'm so glad someone's making fun of this so it like kind of goes to the core audience do you i mean do you schedule i mean that's an interesting point do you do you schedule the episodes so that way they go out in in a way that it's like okay these Next episode is going to be um, targeted towards our core audience. Where this one we know is kind of a more of a high end general humor. So, right. like, do you do that kind of planning with the episode schedule? Yeah, I mean, there's no like hard science about it or anything like that. We put out a new episode every Wednesday, so you know, we we that's our fixed schedule. And from there, I, yeah, I think there's just a rhythm of like, hey, we just had like uh, uh, an episode or two focused on engineers. Why don't we have one that's more geared towards designers, or or we had one that's more sort of any anyone would get a kick out of this. It's just loosely about you know. Mm-hmm. social media or apps in general and then from there then we might be okay well now we can do one that's a little more specific to you know sysadmins or hackathons or something like that so I, I think there's just some sort of like not trying to be one note all the time I think we're just trying to change it up enough from week to week that people you know still feel it's fresh or if last week wasn't for them maybe this week applies to them yeah the hackathon one that one that was good Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Bath, bathroom hackathon yeah yeah well uh, that's Eddie, that's an interesting <laughs> free labor <laughs> <laughs> yeah, totally. I mean, I think that that episode is an interesting one because that uh, was generated by a tweet, basically. So we have our at Booz HQ is our Twitter feed where 
you know, we have like a couple times a day we're posting jokes about the tech world, and then it's always that sometimes one of those will take off and get retweeted, you know, dozens or hundreds of times or something like that, and that'll be like, okay, well, that's clearly hitting some sort of nerve. How can we turn that into an episode? So, I think that's uh, kind of an interesting thing too. Is that you know sometimes the ideas is kind of you know being fed to us from from the response on social media to you know just sort of one liners that we throw out there. Yeah, and just you know the the last uh, question uh, I want to bring up, unless something else comes out of this, is uh, you know you have a really interesting advertising model, uh, one that on Utastic I tried to figure out. I'm a one man shop, so I haven't quite been able to figure it out, and, and I'm not nearly as entertaining as you guys. But uh, the the uh, the, the uh, what it was the term you used for it the the advertising where it's not advertising where you simulate a, a, a comedy i've watched a few of those and i watched through them not realizing that i'm not watching an episode i remember there's the one with jason freed who uh you know it's pretty funny where he's he's pretty deadpan and you seem to be working around him a lot in the in the uh in the advertising but it's an interesting advertising model and i'm just curious about how you came up with it and how you know how is it working <laughs> sure uh, so far, so good. I mean, I, I like to tell people uh, we're just like a real startup, except we actually make money. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, unlike, th- unlike Vuza, the show. Exactly. exactly. Vuza, the show actually makes money. Um, yeah, I mean, I think so. You know, from from the outset, that was a goal was to like make money off it and to make this sustainable. Um, and I think you know, one inspiration was uh, the Deck, which is an ad network that. 37 Signals and Kudal Partners actually started years ago, which was uh, sort of ads dedicated to what they call creative professionals, you know, designers or filmmakers or, or people who work on the web in different ways, and and then partnering with advertisers like, like Adobe or, or people who make fonts or things like that to kind of make ads. You know, you, hey, you can kind of assemble this audience with this network of sites and sell and have ads that are actually appealing to them and have it not be an obstacle or an intrusion or like, hey, this is something from Toyota or Snickers or something you don't care about. Instead, have it be like, hey, we're the guys running this ad network. We're picking all the sites and the people who are making this content. And then we're also finding advertisers who we actually like and use their product and think it's a good fit. And, you know, you can kind of create like a whole ecosystem of people who are actually liking what they're seeing and it's advertising, but it doesn't feel like it's bugging you. So I think... That was interesting to me back when we did that years ago, and then I think you also had just the rise of, of native advertising and branded content, and and that sort of taking over in in, in print or whatever you want to call it, uh, uh, content media, or, you know, words and articles and things like that. You start seeing that more and more, and wondering, hey, is there a way to do this in video? And I, th- I think also it's like people sometimes are like, oh, this is a very innovative, you know futuristic way to do advertising, which to me is kind of funny because it's also exactly the way advertising started on TV back in the 50s or on radio where, you know, you'd you'd have, yeah, exactly. You'd have, you know, Howard Stern used to, I'm a huge Howard Stern fan, you know, always used to stop his show and do plugs. And I think it works in a couple of ways. You know, you've got the actors or the people on the show talking about the product. So that makes it feel much different than, you know, a typical commercial. Mm -hmm. It happens within an episode, you know, we also do pre and post roll ads, but like a lot of the branded episodes we do are, are the product is mentioned within the episode but we try to do it in a subtle enough way that's not really annoying and that it's, it's still like usually those episodes get to be longer they're you know three minutes instead of a minute and a half and so you know I think you know there's a way to look at it. it's like hey this this advertiser is helping you get more content than you yeah. would otherwise and also we're working with people who like it's right for our audience it's not just some random brand it's people like New Relic or Ustream or MailChimp uh, or insightly, people who like they're making products that are for the people in our audience, and it's it's kind of this mutually beneficial thing. So the goal is to you know have it be advertising, but that's not like really obnoxious and annoying and in your face. And it's not uh, yeah, stopping here's a commercial for brand exactly, day. exactly. And I think again, it goes back to the the fact that we're doing this with low overhead and with just a few people enables us to kind of like hey, like w- let's you and me are going to get together and film this ad for New Relic and it's going to be us talking about this product and, and do it quickly. Whereas, you know, if it's uh, Big Bang Theory or something like that, that's probably going to be harder and more expensive for any, any brand to, to work in that way. And I think also that, uh, the other thing is that we're not, we're not trying to get Toyota and Snickers and, and, and these massive brands that are going through agencies and doing, you know, 
tens of millions of dollar media buys. We're working with people who maybe have never done video content before or who have like an explainer video but want to do something that's a little bit funnier instead of just that straightforward informative style. And so these are people who, you know, instead of having to go through an ad agency and waiting like eight months, I can, you know, kind of talk with someone in marketing there and, you know, in, in three weeks get, get the go ahead and get the check signed and, and make something for them. So I, I think it's just a, a new way of doing stuff and, you know, sort of it's interesting because I think the fact that we're small and, and doing it on our own, it's in some ways a weakness, but it's also helped us kind of maybe find the right audience who, who we want to work with and the right advertisers who want to reach that audience. And I have to think also just because of the the, the material material you're dealing with, it might even be possible to just to send them a clip that's relevant right to them and be like, hey, this is here's a three minute clip of, of an episode that and you're able to talk right to them because you know, if you do a marketing heavy heavy episode, you send it to the marketing department. Yeah, they'll laugh that, and they'll be like, "Oh yeah, they, that actually it. that just happened. We've got a new video coming out about uh, uh, our, the new support rep at Vuza, and we had the script and, and sent it to a company that was you know does uh, has a support uh, app, and that now they're going to be sponsoring the episode. And so, <laughs> yeah, it's like sometimes it works out great where we're like, okay, we've got the script that we think is funny who would be a good person to sponsor this and run it past them. And that's actually happened a couple of times. So I think like, to me, that's great. Cause then that's not, you know, like we're making some, some bullshit content that no one actually wants just to please an advertiser. Yeah. We're like, Hey, we're, this is the funny thing that we're going to do anyway. And people are going to like it. Why don't you get your brand involved and it's going to be good for you and yeah. good for us. And, and, the viewers are, are barely going to notice that's any different than any other episode. So it, it just seems like it, maybe there's a way to make stuff that, that works for everyone involved. Well, I, I think somebody – I read somewhere that somebody said um, – in, in it was like an honest trailer or something like that where uh, it showed a picture of uh, Mark Wahlberg in the last Transformers movie drinking a Bud Light. And it says – and the caption is, this movie brought to you by Mark Wahlberg drinking a Bud Light. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, you know – this yeah, episode brought to you by us thinking that this marketing thing is funny, so a marketing company came and supported us, so we'll get get to do another episode next week. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. And I, we're also exploring other models, like we'll, we'll be launching on uh, Patreon soon in a way that viewers can actually, you know, donate to the show itself just in case they want to support us, you know, like I, I think the, the ideal is to have, you know, viewers, you know, paying you for exactly what they want, you know, as, a, as opposed to just relying exclusively on advertisers. But I think, you know, realistically, maybe there's some sort of hybrid model we can do where, hey, if there's people who really love it and just want to throw us some cash because they want to support us and help us do it and yeah. help us pay everyone involved, that's great. If there's advertisers who want to reach our audience, then that's also great. And just sort of play around, you know, just from a business standpoint with like, what is, what's the new way to do content and, and make it sustainable and keep it going? And how can we let people who like it, you know, give us money and let brands who want to reach our audience, you know, also be part of it. So I, I, it's, it's kind of, uh, it's like a real startup in that way of just trying to figure out how to, how to keep this going and how to make money off it and, and what's the best path. And, you know, like there's new technologies coming out that make different, different approaches possible. And so, I, I, you know, I, my, my goal is to make good stuff that people like. But, you know, part of that is also, you know, figuring out the business side of things so you get to right. keep doing it. Well, yeah, and there's there's a lot more people starting to think about that aspect. Uh, the Vlog Brothers, are you familiar with their channel? I'm um, not. They're, uh, I've, heard, I've heard the name, but I don't yeah, know. Yeah, but they, they've come out with a um, – I'm trying to blank on the name of it right now, but they just – they're huge. Um, and they just launched a program to support uh, media uh, content creators who are, are not quite at the, the volume of views to really generate uh, – a living wage from their YouTube channels, but are large enough to have a sustainable audience that's very targeted and very niche. And they, it's like maybe you only have a hundred thousand viewers, but they're you know in in a niche and and you're you're making content directly for them. How can people support that channel that might not otherwise be easily monetizable? Um, yeah, I think you also like live events and and merch and other stuff. Is all, people are going to start cropping up with all different kinds of ideas. So if you've got an audience of people who like you and want to support you, how do, how do you figure that out? And what what are the different ways to actually like turn that into money that you can use to keep it going? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you very much for taking the time to uh, sit down and chat. Uh, the for everybody who's watching, it's vuza.com v o o z a dot com and at vuza h q on Twitter. Matt, thank you again for taking the time to, to speak with me. It was a lot of fun. 
Thanks so much. I enjoyed it. Take care. User groups with lots to say, interviews and more. No way. Sharing great ideas in the tech community. Fascinating conversations, a plethora of information. Find out for yourself today at ugtastic.com.